In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the basic 10 rules and a direct derivation. At this point, I'm assuming that you've watched the lecture videos for Unit 4 and have a basic understanding of what a derivation should be, and we're going to walk through a pretty simple one where we're going to focus on what are called the automatic moves, so one of the most important steps in my derivation solving. So a derivation essentially has three columns to it. First, we have the line numbers, where we indicate what line we're talking about so that we can reference. Then we have the main column, which is where we're going to put all our symbolic language. And then we have the third column, which is where we write actually what it is that we're doing. Now, whenever we start a derivation, we always write our show line. So in this case, we always want to write what it is that our goal at the time is, what I actually want to do. And so here, I have three premises, premise one, two, three, oh, I have four premises, and then I have a conclusion. And my goal is to show that from the truth of these premises, which I assume, that the conclusion follows. That is, I want to show this is a valid argument. So I want to show w or not t is true, given my premises are all true. And so I don't have to state anything about the fact that my premises are true, I actually just get to assume that. So I'm going to write down the show line and I'm going to proceed directly and hope to solve this derivation in what is called a direct derivation, which is we get precisely what we want, and I'm only going to use the basic 10 rules. Now my basic 10 rules are divided into introduction and uh, rules and elimination rules. Elimination rules are typically what we use for automatic moves. So that means whenever we look at a premise, we see what main connective it is, and then I ask what the associated uh, elimination rule here is. So here's the main connective of the first premise, here's the main connective of the second premise, here's the main connective of the third, and here's the main connective of the fourth. Now I'm going to point out that if you're struggling or you're unable to solve this problem, odds are you actually didn't identify the main connective correctly. You might have made a mistake on premise two or premise four. So even though I went through that pretty quickly, you really need to make sure you can identify the main connective, because the main connective tells you what the sentence is and what you can do to it. Now, when looking at the first premise, the main connective is a conjunction. And so whenever I have a conjunction, I ask, what is the elimination conjunction rule? And that is just the simplification rule. And that makes sense. If I have fries and salad, that's the same thing as having fries. That's the same thing as having salad. And this is what I call an automatic move. It's a move that you don't really have to think about to do. You should just do it. So immediately, I can say I get P, and that's premise one uh, simplification. Now, just a side note, if you're using uh, Logic 2010, it makes you write the R, PR1. I don't care either way if you're just solving this by hand. And another Logic 2010 shortcut is instead of writing S for simplify, you could write SL and it will know that you're grabbing the P. You can do any combination of these on a test, it doesn't matter to me one bit. Now similarly, I'm going to actually get the right conjunct as well, and I'll just write the code, that's premise 1, simplify. You could have again written simplify right, that doesn't really matter, and we get negation r. So I immediately have p and negation r from this premise, and I'm going to put a little check mark above it to indicate that I've actually done uh, everything I can do to that premise. Then I have premise 2, which is disjunction, premise 3, which is a conditional, and premise 4, that's a conditional. So I always have to ask what the associated elimination rules for these are. For the con Additional, it's modus ponens or modus tollens. And modus ponens says, if I have the antecedent, I can get the consequent. Modus tollens says, if I get the negation of the consequent, I get the negation of the antecedent. Unfortunately, I don't have either of these things now, so I'm going to pause. Now, here is my second premise, and this is a disjunction. And the only associated rule with the disjunction is modus tollendo ponens, MTP. And MTP has a general slogan, which is really nice, that says, if not one, than the other. So I'm looking for the negation of one side. Well, one side is negation P, one side is S. I take a look at what I have. I have P, negation R. Well, I certainly don't have the negation S, but do I have the negation of the negation P? Almost. What I need to do here is double negate my line 2. So that's line 2, double negate. And now I literally have the negation of this, because you can see here, that's the blue, negation P, negation P, and now I have the negation of it. So you have to remember that the rules are literal. I'm going to give more examples in this in the future. You could not just use this P, even though technically it is the negation, in a sense, of negation P. You need to be literal. If the rule says, not if not one side, then you need the negation of one side. Now I'm able to apply the MTP rule, 
And the rule says, if not one side, then the other. So I can now conclude S, and that is line 4 and premise 2, and I use the rule MTP. Okay, so this is the S. Now, whenever you get something, you want to look elsewhere in the proof to say, hey, you know, do I have uh, this um, option to, to sort of do something with? So here I have an S, that's over here. But notice I also have this negation R, and that's over here. So earlier, I was sort of just trying to get through this, but I said, oh, I don't have the negation of the consequent. But it turns out I do. So I'll highlight that and here. Now, the nice thing about this is I'm sort of showing you it doesn't matter which order you do it in. If you had actually done the modus tollens here first, uh, it's perfectly fine, uh, and then done the MTP second. As long as you proceed logically, it doesn't matter what order you get. In fact, there's infinitely many ways to solve a derivation because of all the sort of extra lines that you could put in. So now this negation R, that's the opposite of the consequent. So modus tollens said if you have the negation of the consequent, you get the negation of the antecedent. That's an inference rule. So I immediately get not Q. And that follows from line 3, premise 3, modus tollens. So now my two lines that I have new are line 5 and 6. I have the S and not Q. But that's actually pretty nice because if I look over here, S and not Q is the antecedent of this entire conditional statement. So all I have to do to build the conjunction is introduce the conjunction, and the conjunction introduction rule is just a, a join. So I'll take 6 and not Q, and I get 5, 6, A, D, J. And so obviously if I have S and not Q, I also have S and not Q. Now this is good because this is the antecedent I was looking for over here. So now I can do modus ponens, which says if you have a conditional and you have the antecedent, which I do, then you can infer the consequent, W. And so now that is 7 premise 4 modus ponens. Now, I just did a lot of work here without actually asking what it is I was trying to solve. And this type of work I like to call automatic moves. You don't really think too hard about them. You just do them because it's obvious in a sense you should do them. Because you're trying to break down these main connectives to get simpler parts. But now that I've done that, it makes sense for me to go back and look at what I'm trying to solve. Which is this uh, W or negation T. So to get W or negation T, uh, I just have to ask about the OR introduction rule. And the OR introduction rule is a rule that lots of students sort of mess up at first, but then becomes you, you probably your favorite rule. It's called addition. And addition says, if you want to build an OR statement, you just need one side. So in this case, clearly the side I'm going to shoot for is W. Why? Well, because I already have it. And T doesn't appear anywhere else in my derivation. So I'm going to search for W. I have it. And according to the add rule, if I have W, I can immediately infer W or anything I want. So I'm going to, of course, add negation T. Now, a direct derivation is when you get exactly what you wanted. So here I wanted to show W or not T, and I proved W or not T does indeed follow. So I could add another line here. I could say on line 9 I got a direct derivation, and that's totally fine. But that's actually a little inefficient, so I'll just scribble it out. Just just in case. And what you can do is once you actually get what you want, you can actually just write immediately in the same line DD. This also works in Logic 2010. And so what I'm going to do now is say this is indicating that on line 9 I got exactly what I wanted, which means I can cross off the show line. I don't know why I crossed off twice, you just need to cross it off once. And then you box or contain all the lines that generated the show line you were looking for. If you want to close the box fully, that's fine. And so what this is saying is everything from 2 through 9 was used to prove that W or not T follows. And now that I've boxed and crossed off my show line on line 1, the derivation is complete. This was a very long-winded approach to a question that, once you're good at, will probably take you around 30 seconds to solve. I just wanted to go through all the different columns and be very slow here. I didn't skip any steps, I didn't really combine any moves, and I hope that I just nicely explained what the automatic moves look like in the premises and how we can walk through to get a direct derivation.